Bibles. We're going to be in Acts chapter number 6. Acts chapter number 6. Growing up, how many of you, you ever experienced growing pains? Do you remember that as your body began to grow and uh, you experienced growing pains? What is growing pains? It's times when as your body stretches to new dimensions, you feel some discomfort and some pain in unexpected places. I know your pastor, he is a Los Angeles Lakers fan. I live about 45 minutes from the Lakers stadium. I am not a Los Angeles Lakers fan. I'm a Lakers hater. My son Trey is a, is a Los Angeles Clippers fan, and so I've kind of jumped on with him. But he's a Los Angeles Lakers fan and a, a Kentucky University, Kentucky Wildcat basketball fan. So I think this illustration is fitting for you. But one of the best players to go through uh, Kentucky that is now one of the best players in the NBA is six foot eleven inch all star power forward Anthony Davis. And uh, here is Anthony Davis. He's six foot. This is when he was younger in high school. Six foot eleven inches. This is him when he was just a couple of years before that. What's interesting is Anthony Davis. This is I think his freshman year to his senior year. He grew from six foot two inches, kind of a maybe a little above average, but a pretty average height, six foot two inches to over six foot ten inches in his high school career. Eight inches from six two to six ten between actually it was between his sophomore and senior years. In the course of about twenty four to thirty six months, he grew that. When he was six foot two, he had one scholarship offer from a college called Cleveland State. I don't know their mascot and you probably don't either. By his senior year he was the number one high school player in the nation. Dave's parents, he tells the story, had to buy him new clothes constantly. He was always growing out of them. Davis had to learn to play a different position. He had to learn how to rebound, to block shots, to post up. His heroes shifted from uh, small guards to big men. He had to learn a whole new position because he went from what would be, in, in high school basketball, a guard height to a, one of the tallest guys on the court. And he went through tremendous physical growing pains. We're going to see in the book of Acts here, we're going to see the early church doing the same thing. And my message this morning is, is, is that title. It's entitled, it's titled Growing Pains. Acts 6 describes some of the blessings and challenges of growing pains in the church. We're going to walk through the first seven verses of Acts 6. But by way of review or context, just to see kind of where we're at in Acts 6, I want you to read with me uh, the last verse of Acts 5 aloud. If you have your Bibles, we're going to read Acts 5, verse number 42 aloud together. Acts 5, verse 42. Would you read that aloud with me? Ready? Begin. And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. What is happening right now is... Every day, not, not just on Sundays or Tuesdays or Wednesdays or Thursdays, every day they're preaching Christ. And we, we know, of course, Jesus has just ascended back into heaven. The Holy Spirit has come in power. The disciples are now spreading and they're preaching the gospel. We had the, the, the Pentecost where thousands were saved and added to the church. Um, and all this happening. And then in, in, from house to house, they're coming together and they're learning and they're growing. And what is happening, the early church is growing. They, the, the, and, and right after this, what's just been happened is the apostles had been beaten and they've been released. They've been told, don't preach anymore. And so we see the early church. What we have is a group of believers where the gospel is multiplied and it doesn't look like it looked for the three years before when, 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 when there were a dozen apostles and maybe in the upper room, 120. You're talking about um, dozens. Now we're into the thousands of the church. And what do we see? We see what happens as they uh, go through persecution, as they preach daily in the temple, they're sharing the gospel of Christ. Look at the first half of chapter 6, verse number 1. We see it in those days that when the number of the disciples was multiplied. If you'd like to take notes, I'm going to give you four main uh, points today with some, some things underneath them. But I see number one here in the passage, the blessing. I see the blessing in the first half of chapter 1. The number of the disciples was multiplied. Isn't that the goal as believers? That we have the truth and we want to see others come to the truth. We want to see uh, the disciples multiplied. The, the church is growing exponentially. Some have talked about 
the mathematics of the church in the book of Acts. And what happened? Members were added. Corruption was subtracted. The church multiplied. And that is the story of this church. So we see a great blessing. And this morning, we're celebrating the blessings of Harvest Baptist Church in Orland. But I see in the second half of the verse, not only the blessing, but the problem. Look at what it says. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, you would think you would say the rest of the verse, everybody rejoiced and celebrated and posted on Facebook about how much they loved their church. That's what you would think the rest of verse number one might say. And what does it say? And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a what church? There arose a what? A what? What? The gospel's going forth. People are getting saved. Mo disciples are being multiplied. Why are we not rejoicing? Growing pains. There arose a murmuring, it says, uh, of the Grecians against the Hebrews, the Greeks and the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. The early church contained both Greek Jews and Hebrew Jews, who had, before their conversion, these groups did not look kindly on each other. And the Greek Jews were frequently categorized as second-class Israelites. So growing up, the Hebrew Jews would look down on the, the Grecians, the Greek Jews, and now they're in the same church together. Do you understand that the gospel brings a whole lot of different people together? The gospel brings people together that look different, that have different upbringings, that have different backgrounds, that have different likes and dislikes, different personalities and preferences, different religious upbringings and traditions. The gospel brings a whole lot of different people together. And if we're not careful when we bring our differences together, it can create division and discord. And that's what's happening here is what had happened was there was a feeling they weren't being properly cared for. Because the church took the responsibility, according to scripture, to care for the needs of widows if those widows could not earn a living and had no living relatives who could care for them. So the problem was that as the church grew, the logistics of caring for every person grew along with the growth of the church. And some, I don't believe because the disciples or the apostles were, were didn't love the Lord and didn't love the people, but because they were human, some needs were unmet. Have you recognized, those that have been here when the church was smaller, that as it has grown, sometimes the church looks a little different? Things happen a little differently. At times, maybe it feels like it's not like it used to be. I used to be able to just talk to Pastor Davis for six hours a day whenever I wanted it. Now he's busy. And I kind of like the old days. If you ever feel that way, you're having the same feelings they had here in Acts chapter number six, verse number one, of hey, my needs aren't being met like they used to be. I wish our church wasn't growing the way that it is. And so as the church grew, the logistics of caring for every person caused some people's needs to be unmet, and they took it personally. And that's easy to happen in a church family. When we feel we've been mistreated or forgotten or a situation was handled in a way, we can take personal attack and we can begin to murmur. And it's interesting, on a day like today, I don't sense any of that. We're all in celebration. But as we go through, all of a sudden, well, why did they say that? And why didn't they honor me? And why didn't they honor her? And why did that happen? Why didn't, my, why didn't I get asked to do that? And why the pastor forgot my anniversary? And I was in the hospital and nobody visited me. And by the way, if you know someone in the hospital, you should visit them and you should love them and pray for them and maybe help with a meal. But if you're the one that was in the hospital and no one does that for you, and don't, don't just immediately think, well, that church doesn't love me. Maybe it was just an honest, innocent mistake, and there's just some growing pains. Give some grace. And so we see the problem here, and it's interesting. It's amazing that even in the early church, Satan was doing everything he could to destroy this early church of new believers where the disciples were multiplying. What did he use to try to destroy the church? By the way, it's the same thing he uses to destruct, try to destroy churches today. He used persecution. Now, thankfully in America, I say thankfully, we really don't have to face much of this. But there are churches around the world that do face this. And so you can sometimes a church can be attacked from without. And they, they had just gotten out of prison. They were persecuting Paul and the early believers and the apostles. They were persecuting them. Why? For at this time Paul's on the scene, but they were persecuting them uh, for, for preaching the gospel, and sometimes Satan attacks from without. Sometimes Satan seeks to attack and divide and destroy a church through corruption. I don't know the long history of this church, 
But if your church's history is anything like my church's 48-year history, there may have been some spiritual leaders at some point in this history where there was some corruption. There was some things in the church of either the pastor or spiritual leaders where sin came in and Satan can use that to divide and destroy a church. And that had happened here, Ananias and Sapphira. From within, there was corruption. There were sin issues in the membership of the church. And then what we see here is we see that Satan tried to destroy the church through dissension and distraction. With discord, getting them off mission. And may I just tell you, Pastor Ives, Pastor Davis has not told me one thing of division or discord or distraction or infighting. If it's happening here, I don't know about it. And so if it's happening with you in your heart, that's the Holy Spirit. That's not me or your pastor. If it's not happening here, if you keep serving together for any length of time, there will be opportunities for you to get distracted from the mission of reaching this area and the world with the gospel of Christ and to start infighting, start having dissension and division and discord. And I just want to say on your five-year anniversary, what God is doing here is amazing. Don't let uh, persecution, if it comes, to get you off track. Don't let corruption, if a member of the church falls into some sin, get you off track. Deal with it biblically, but don't let it destroy the church. And don't let attacks from within, gossip and discord and division and debate and, and disputations, don't let Satan destroy what God's doing here through those things. By the way, I would say I'm aware of more churches being hurt and more Christians being affected by this one than probably both of these, for sure this, because of where we serve. It is somewhat encouraging that even the early church faced these things. But what do we see? What was the problem in the early church? The problem was unmet needs. Unmet needs. Their needs were being met. I want to stop and say as the outside pastor, the church doesn't exist to meet your needs. That We exist to meet the needs of those that don't know Jesus Christ. Now I do think there's something about we should serve one another. We should love one another. If you know someone in need, you should meet them. But we are not consumers that come and say, here are all of my needs, meet all of my needs. No, we are members of a body that say, how can I come and contribute to the health of this body? Being a church member is much more about being a contributing member of a physical body than it is being a consumer, card-carrying member of some organization. So we have unmet needs, and then what was the problem was murmuring. How many people have left the church because they saw a real or perceived wrong and began to murmur about it, began to complain to le about the leadership, began to talk to others about it. Before you know it, you're coming to church just to find things to get upset about. And do you know if you're looking for imperfections in this church, you can find them? Because you're here. And I'm here. And do you know if you want to find imperfections in your pastor and his wife, you can find them? And I know a lot of them. See me afterwards, I'll share them with you. You can, there's no such thing as a perfect church. And if there was, if I joined it and you joined it, it'd get messed up. But be careful. Satan loves to get us murmuring against each other. Well, did you see what she did? And did you see how he handled that? And why would they come to church with that and do that and say that and go there? And forget that. Keep our eyes on Christ and let him keep seeing the disciples multiply. I read a, a story of a family that was moving from one town to another. They were moving from Johnstown to Jamestown. They were moving, and they were traveling down the road, and they stopped, and they saw an older man, a far, a, a Farmer Jones was his name. I think this is a fictional story. But he stopped to get a glass of water, and he gave it to them. He asked them, where are you headed? And they told him, we're moving from uh, Johnstown to Jamestown. Can you tell us what the people there are like? And Farmer John Jones, with his old country wisdom, he had been around the block for a while, and he knew a little something about people. He said, well, what kind of people did you find where you lived before? To which they replied, oh, they were the very worst kind. They were gossips, they were unkind, they were indifferent. We're glad to move away from those people and get out of that place. Farmer Jones replied, well, I'm afraid you're going to find the same people in Jamestown. The next day, another car stopped, and the same conversation took place. And these people were moving to Jamestown, too, and they asked, what kind of neighbors will we find there? Well, Farmer Jones asked, what kind of neighbors did you have where you lived before? The couple responded, oh, they were the very best. They were so kind and considerate, it almost broke our hearts to have to move away. Farmer Jones replied, well, you'll find the exact same kind of people where you're moving. Very often, may I say, in life and in church, 
you'll find what you're looking for. If you're looking for a reason to be critical, you'll find it. If you're looking for a reason to rejoice, you'll find it. And you see, they took their complaint to the wrong place. It says there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. They took their complaint to the wrong person. They should have gone to church leadership. Matthew 18 says, if you have a problem, go directly and talk to those that can help with that and deal with that. And I just want to say this morning, a good rule of life at work, in your family, on Facebook, and at church, if you're not a part of the problem or a part of the solution, you probably shouldn't be a part of the conversation. That's just good wisdom in every area of your life. We, we, none of us need more drama in our lives, do we? And we get mixed up in it on politics and Facebook and at work. And why did they do that? Why did she get the promotion? And at church, and it's just human nature. If we're not part of the problem or the solution, we probably shouldn't be part of the conversation. Thankfully, the church leadership became aware of the problem here, and it was remedied. And we see, we see here, uh, verse number three, we see this, I'm sorry, uh, point number three, we see the solution, verse number two. Look what happens. So we have the blessing, the church is multiplying, the problem, there's unmet needs, dissension, murmuring. We see the solution. Would you look at verses two through six with me? Then the twelve, those are the leaders, those are the, the if you will, if I could call them the pastors, the, the spiritual leaders of the of them. The twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them. The, the pastors called the church family together and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, the first deacons. We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Would you read the first phrase of verse 5 up to the word multitude aloud? Starting with the word and, let's end with the word multitude. Ready? Begin. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. It lists the name of the seven deacons they chose. Verse number 6, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. What was the solution to a growing church that started to have some issues or problems they hadn't had before? What was the solution? I'm going to give you, I'm going to suggest to you, the solution was twofold. The solution was, number one, a serving membership. Well, I need the church to serve me more. No, we need to serve each other more. I, I, I want the church to do this for me. No, what can I do to, to reach others through the church? A serving. What was the answer to that murmur? You know, a lot of times the answer to your problems and your murmuring is just to get out and serve someone else. Because when we start serving others, it takes our eyes off of ourselves and our own problems. You know what you should do if you're struggling with somebody, you're kind of angry and upset with someone? Pray for them. It's really hard to stay angry with somebody you pray a whole lot for. Do something kind for them. Isn't that what the Bible says? That, that, that a soft answer turneth away wrath. If somebody does something wrong to you, you should serve them. If they take your coat, give them your cloak also. Hey, somebody does you wrong, I'm going to get even with them. No, I'm going to serve them more. Now, that's counterintuitive. And I'll be honest, it's not natural for me. I don't like to do it, and too often I don't do it. But it's biblical, and it's Christ-like. What did Christ, -like, Christ do? He didn't focus on his needs. He served others. He came not to be ministered to. He came to minister. Paul. In prison, didn't say meet my needs. He said, hey, let's meet one another's needs. Let's get the gospel to more people. What should we do? What's the solution when a church begins to grow and it starts to feel like, man, I like a lot of it, but it's not like it used to be. And it's not as fun. I kind of miss we were a small family and now we're a big family. No, we, we, yes, that's good. But we're, don't, don't, don't miss for the good old days. Say, God, we want to look back and say, how can this family, whatever size it is, reach more people so that years from now we're rejoicing with others, a serving membership. A great reminder, God calls, we see here, calls all of his people to ministry, but he calls different people to different ministries. He says here, I want some of our members to start serving in ways they weren't serving before. Biblical church membership says, this is where I serve, not just this is where I listen to sermons. People in the early church willing to take on new roles for the sake of the gospel. Okay, we need a deacon, we need someone to care for widows, we need someone to head up that ministry. May I just challenge you, is there maybe a role that you could take on to be a blessing to the furtherance of the gospel through this local church body? Aren't you glad these seven deacons were willing to say, I'm willing to serve God in some new capacities, in some ways I haven't before, so that the, the, the gospel can go forth in great power. 
D.L. Moody said it's better to put 10 men to work than to try to do the work of 10 men. I see here that people were willing to allow the church to be restructured for the sake of better ministry and future growth. As the church grew in the Acts, the structure changed. The leadership changed. I don't know if God will lead at some point for God will add more people to the spiritual leadership of this church. Maybe an assistant pastor or something there. And God will use some of you to step up into other roles and whatever that might be. And when those things happen, growth always takes some change. When those things happen, if we're not careful, none of us like change by nature. Our response can be to push against it. And I want to challenge you. I said at the beginning, I don't think God is done. But it's going to take a group of people that are willing to go through some growing pains. Have there been any growing pains in the last five years in this church? Sure there have. But when they're viewed in light of the gospel, they're not painful at all. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. And let's keep that mindset in our lives. I love what it says at the beginning of verse 5. The saying pleased the whole multitude. What saying? The saying that we're going to be bringing some new leaders into the church. The saying that we're going to be changing the structure. The saying that some new people are going to be serving in some new ways. The saying that we're going to reorganize some things. Nobody said, but that's not how we've always done it. Well, that's not how we used to do it. Well, that, somebody said the, the last five or seven words of a dying church. That's the way we've always done it, however many words that is. Be careful we don't get, I don't think this church has that spirit, but that spirit can creep into any believer and into any church. No. What happened when they started having growing pains? The people didn't say, who can we criticize? The people said, where can we serve? How can we meet the need? How can we jump in and give toward that need a serving membership? And I, I think we have it on a slide here. I love this quote. Uh, the more the church is serving others, the less we'll be murmuring about one another. The more we're serving, the less we'll be murmuring. What was the solution? I'm almost done. Serving membership and spiritual leadership. Pray for your pastor. Because the more people come to this church and the more work that you're trying to do and the more missionaries that you support and the more uh, events that you have with teen camp and ladies Bible study and men's Bible study, the more details there are on his plate, the easier it becomes for him to get distracted from his most important work, which is the ministry of prayer and the word. That's what it says here. Right. It's not reason that we should leave the, the word and prayer to go serve tables. Yeah. You pray that your pastor will keep his relationship with God and his study of the Word and his ministry of prayer as top priority. And if you see him getting burdened down with some of those things, or his wife, hey, what can we take off so that you can keep feeding us on Sundays, on our services, and you can you can give us the Word, and you can pray for us, and you can do the work of a pastor. What fixed their problems? A serving membership and spiritual leadership. The disciples say, we're not... By the way, is serving widows a good work? Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. Is helping people in need a good work? Yes or no? Yeah. But here they said there's an even greater work for the leaders, and that is the ministry of prayer and the word. Now, that doesn't mean a pastor shouldn't serve a widow. What it means is even the good work of the ministry can sometimes overtake the most important work of a pastor's ministry. And so understanding those things, the word cannot spread when the ministry of the word is neglected. Prayer and preparation is the, the time for, the, for, is the priority for the pastor. And by the way, the more that Pastor Davis is spending in the spiritual priorities of a pastor, the more that the church family is involved in service, the healthier and stronger the church will become. And then lastly, you've listened well. We saw the blessing. Church multiplied, and I rejoice with you. You have a story like theirs. We saw the problem. Some needs were unmet. Some personalities conflicted. Some people thought they were being neglected, and they started complaining. Now, I think I'm going to find another church. The only problem for them was there wasn't another church to go to, but that's what we would say today. I need to go somewhere else. And by the way, God leads. I've moved churches. At times, God leads people. But don't make that your first idea when you have a problem with the church. The, 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 the blessing was that the, church, the disciples multiplied. The problem was that some division came. The solution was a serving membership and spiritual leadership. The result was, what did we see here? Number one, when they began to understand that the gospel is more important than their personality conflicts and their unmet needs, what we see is unity. It says it pleased the whole 
multitude. A church that was in danger of splitting is now enjoying blessed unity. And then lastly, what was the result? The result was exponential impact. Would you read verse number 7, and I'm done. Verse number 7, I'll close it up. Ready? Begin. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient wouldn't you love that to be the story in the next five years of Harvest Baptist Church? And the Word of God, what did it say there? Increased. The Word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. What happened when a growing church faced with some conflict decided to rally around and serve each other and, and allow their pastor to lead them in spiritual ways. What happened? They found unity. The entire multitude was pleased. And what happened? They found exponential impact. Do you know what has happened is there's been a small group of believers that have rallied around behind your new pastor five years ago, and then that small group got a little bigger and got a little bigger and got a little bigger. Guess what happened? The word of God, exponential impact in Orland. And by the way, a couple of years ago, you started a missions program, and then you started giving to missions, and you've had missionaries come through, and some of you are going on a missions trip to Nicaragua. What has happened as the, the focus has been, how can we love God and serve one another? What has happened is exponential impact. Impact, and God is not done, Harvest Baptist Church. He's not done. Exponential impact. It's amazing what God can do through a church that is unified, willing to be flexible and allow some structural changes. So I'm not talking about doctrinal changes. I'm talking about structural changes. I'm not talking about biblical changes. I'm talking about preferential changes. Well, I, I don't like meeting out in tents. Well, get over it. We're meeting in the tent. You do, but just have a good attitude and sweat away and drink a lot of water and go home and take a shower, all right? And meet in tents. And, but people find the craziest things to fight about in churches. Don't let our personalities and our personal conflicts and our personal preferences stop the work that God is doing here. One commentary I read wrote the true story of a church in Dallas. It said when this church decided to split, each faction filed a lawsuit to claim the church property as their own. A judge finally referred the, mat the matters to the authorities of their denomination. A church court assembled to hear both sides of the case and awarded the property to one of, and to award the property to one of the two factions. The losers withdrew and formed another church in the area. Here's what came out in the true story as the church court here. Where did this start? How did this happen that we ended up splitting a church, taking each other to court, having a, one group got the property, another group took a group of people and started a whole other church. By the way, I'll just tell you, that church wasn't reaching anyone with the gospel during that time period. And, and, and they came out of the church court. What happened? The church court learned the conflict had begun at a church dinner when a certain elder received a smaller slice of ham than a child seated next to him. Why do I give that illustration? Because we're about to go eat. And if you get a smaller plate, don't start fighting, all right? What you do is, if it's a kid next to you, you just swap plates and you eat his. Every man look on his own things and not on the things of others. Is that what the Bible says? Oh, no, don't do that. That's not, that's not what the Bible says. Why do I say that? You know what happens? Pride gets in the way. And probably there might have been, I don't know, but maybe some, oh, he did that on purpose. That, that guy has it out for me. And all of a sudden, conflict, and before you know it, the work of God is being hindered. Don't let that happen to you. I don't believe that God is done with his work here. I believe you're just getting started in the, in the gospel impact here and around the world that he wants to do. But you must guard from attacks from without, corruption from within, and even dissension and division from derailing you of what is most important and leading you there. If you're here this morning and you're a guest, it talked about as the word of God in increased, the, the number of the disciples was multiplied. You heard testimonies this morning of many who have found Jesus Christ as their Savior in this church. I'm here to tell you more important than being a member of Harvest Baptist Church is the question, are you a member of the family of God? What a wonderful day it would be for you that you could look back on the fifth anniversary of this church. It was the day they celebrated five years with Pastor and Mrs. Davis being here, but it was the day you celebrating passing from death unto life, becoming a born-again child of God. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as Savior, 
don't leave this tent without letting me or Pastor Davis, one of the folks in our church, a man or a lady in our church, take the Bible and not tell you what Harvest Baptist Church thinks, but tell you what the Bible says about how you can know for sure when you die you'll spend eternity in heaven. In Harvest Baptist Church, I just want to leave you and remind you what God has done here is amazing. And it is God that's done it. And I don't think He's done. And I don't know of any growing pains your church has been through or is going through, but I know how human nature is. And I know how church, church work goes because we can study it from the very first churches in the book of Acts. When God is blessing, Satan will fight. And I want to challenge you. When the blessing comes, some problems will come because we all have some problems. And when that happens, what's the answer? The answer is a serving membership. The answer is spiritual leadership, love and support and help and lift up those arms. And what happens when we do that? We will see a blessed unity that I sense is here today. And I don't want to see it lose, go, go away. And we will see exponential impact, fruit that abounds to your account of lives that will be forever changed in Orland and around the world. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'm going to invite